Good day, everyone. My name is LJ Stambuk. I'm the president and CEO of the World Affairs Council of Charlotte. And today we have an extremely important program, uh, Breast Cancer, a Global Disease, with Dr. Antoinette Tan, who's the chief of breast medical oncology at Atrium Health Levine Cancer Institute, and Dr. Richard White, White who is the chief for surgical oncology and co-director of the Barbara Levine Breast Center at the Atrium Health Levine Cancer Institute. This conversation will be moderated by our own board member, Dr. Derek Ragawan, who is the president of Atrium Health Levine Cancer Institute. And thank you, doctors. I know how very busy you are and, and how your time is limited. We really appreciate taking time to talk to us, our members, supporters, and board members about this amazing, amazing, amazing uh, uh, a disease that is hitting uh, uh, so many people around the world. Our program partner today is Atrium Health. Thank you for your support and your partnership. Our promotional partners, International House of Charlotte, Carolina Breast Friends, and the World Affairs Council of Northwest Ohio. Thank you for partnering with us today on this program. And Alliance Frances, I'm so sorry, Alliance Frances is there as well. Uh, World Affairs Council corporate partners, too many to mention, but you can see them here. Thank you all for your support. Without your support, we would not be able to have programs on global issues, health issues as this one today. Global education is our passion at the World Affairs Council of Charlotte. And as you know, we are the community's premier global education nonprofit, nonpartisan organization, where we believe that everyone deserves access to fact based and balanced analysis, commentary, and research on critical global issues. Dialogue, knowledge, active participation, and an understanding of global issues are vitally important for our democracy to flourish at all levels. Couple of housekeeping issues. Your microphone will be on mute and your camera will be turned off for the duration of the presentation. To submit the question anytime, and please do submit questions, use the question and answer box in the Zoom toolbar. It is circled in red. Do not use the chat box. Please use the question and answer box in the Zoom toolbar, again, circled in red right there in the center. Do note that this presentation will be recorded and we will share it with you via the World Affairs Council mailing list. So please make sure you're signed up to receive our emails. These are upcoming programs and there are so many. Um, we uh, invite you to take a quick look at them. I'll mention only one upcoming. It is the World Affairs Council private dinner and CEO series with Chuck Harrington. He's the executive chairman and CEO of Parsons Corporation. Uh, he just stepped down a couple of months before, and he's talking about cybersecurity. Basically, are your companies, are your institutions safe, especially in the view of the Russian invasion of Ukraine? And we all know that the uh, 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 head of the FBI said that they have intensified attacks on cyber uh, structures here in the US. So are you safe? Is your company safe? Is your institution safe? If you're interested in, in learning more about that, join us on April 27, 28. Parsons is one of the leading cybersecurity companies in the world. And we have their CEO with us on those two dates. Um, the rest of the programs you can find on our website. So join us on social media, like, share, follow. We really appreciate that. I will turn it over now, as I understand, uh, to Dr. Derek Ragawan, president of the Levine Cancer Institute and board member of the World Affairs Council of Charlotte. Derek, glad to have you here with us today. Well, it's a great pleasure to be here and to have two such distinguished clinician scientists to present this important topic. I'm not going to go through all their um, litany of achievements. I'll, I'll simply say Antoinette is the chair of the Department of Solid Tumor Oncology at Levine Cancer yeah. Institute. And in addition to that is the chief of the breast medical oncology uh, team. And Richard Wide is the chairman of the Department of Surgical Oncology 
both are national figures. Uh, I always like to mention that Rich was awarded the St. George Medal, which is one of the highest medals of honor from the American Cancer Society, has published and researched extensively in breast cancer. Antoinette has her own book on uh, triple negative disease. I mean, feel free to contact me and I'll get you a copy on eBay and for an extra hundred dollars, we'll get her autograph on it as well. But they are really truly international figures in this uh, domain and in fact, beyond that. Richard has expertise in melanoma among other things and uh, Antoinette has been uh, very extensively published and experienced in using first in man drugs. So I think that's a long enough introduction. Pretty soon they'll ask me to pay them for this appearance and we can't have that. So I'd like to turn this session over to Richard and Antoinette and I will turn my camera off and then I'll come back when we've got some Q&A um, to ask some impossible questions. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Great. Uh, Antoinette are going, and I are gonna discuss breast cancer, a global disease today and uh, in this time allotted, we can really just touch the high points. Uh, but I think it's important to understand that cancer is a leading cause of premature death in every country of the world uh, in the context of our world affairs meeting today. This is a, a beautiful map from the American Cancer Society. And this is the most frequently diagnosed cancer in all of these pink uh, countries highlighted here. And it can be summarized in the following statements. Female breast cancer has now surpassed lung cancer as the leading cause of global uh, cancer incidents in 2020, with an estimated 2.3 million cases, about 11.5% of all cancer cases in the world. It is the fifth leading cause of cancer mortality worldwide with uh, breast cancer accounting for one in four uh, cancer cases and one in six cancer deaths, ranking first for incidents in the vast majority of countries. There are exceptions, uh, most notably being Australia, New Zealand, Northern Europe, North America, and China, where lung cancer exceeds it, but otherwise it is the leading cause of cancer death throughout the world. This chart shows you the incidence of uh, cancer uh, and the mortality of cancer. Interestingly, you can see Australia, New Zealand, Western Europe, sort of developed countries lead the way in incidence. Uh, that's largely due to screening efforts. You can see the mortality is uh, uh, spread on the right side of this, uh, but is a significant cause of mortality as we discussed. This table right here shows you the most common cancer deaths worldwide. You can see in North America, it's lung cancer, but around the world, breast cancer is a leading cause of cancer death. Now, the good news here is these trends, this is uh, data from the United States through the American Cancer Society, is very positive in terms of death rates. The big red bar right here is lung and bronchus. We've made tremendous strides there. You can also see the death rate from breast cancer has dropped substantially over the last several years. You can see colorectal cancer has also dropped uh, substantially, and a lot of this has to do with screening. So very good news here. Now it's important to understand some anatomy. This is a, a picture of the breast. The breast is made up of glands that make milk, ducts that take the milk to the nipple, fat, skin, and the muscle underneath. It's drained uh, by what are called lymph nodes to the underarm called the axilla. Now, these are uh, green tubes or what do we call lymphatics. The problem with breast cancer is we had no treatment for this until this paper was published uh, by William Halstead in the Annals of uh, Surgery in 1895. Efforts have been made throughout Europe uh, and throughout the US, but Halstead was one of the first people to show that you could actually cure women with breast cancer. Now keep in mind, most women that he was seeing had extensive disease that involved the breast and often the muscle underneath. So the operation he proposed was quite extensive as you can see here. It removed the skin, the lymph nodes under the arm and uh, the muscle beneath that. You can imagine this is quite a disfiguring operation, but for the first time ever allowed 
women the opportunity of cure from breast cancer. Now, breast cancer and breast cancer surgery, breast cancer care and breast cancer surgery have evolved dramatically over the last 100 and 120 years. Halstead described this complete radical removal of the breast, the skin, the muscles, the nodal tissue in an effort to try and control the disease. And still, the majority of women died of the breast cancers. This was modified uh, in the middle portion of the last century where the breast and nodal uh, tissues were removed, the muscle was left in place, the skin was left in place, but still a very disfiguring operation. And most of us who are old enough to remember Betty Ford had this operation done. But then it became a question of, did you really need to remove the entire breast? We were able to find smaller and smaller cancers. So we'll talk here in a moment about a partial mastectomy and removal of the lymph nodes uh, called an axillary dissection. That phrase was breast conservation. More recently, we've been able to take out smaller areas of the breast and follow that with just a removal of a certain number of important lymph nodes under the arm called a sentinel node biopsy, breast conservation and node conservation. And we'll talk at the very end of my talk about some um, newer developments. So how did we get to this point? And I made a point of including uh, investigators from around the world. Umberto Veronese was a delightful individual and a brilliant thinker in Italy. And he asked the question, did we really need to remove the entire breast? Now, what he did was fairly crude. He removed an entire corner of the breast called a quadrantectomy. The cosmetics result weren't great, but uh, did allow a woman to actually keep her breast. Bernard Fisher, mentor to Dr. Hajikotic, one of the uh, folks here in our group, uh, described what's called a lumpectomy. This is a relatively small lumpectomy, but the idea here is rather than removing the entire quarter of the breast, you can remove the tumor with a rim of normal tissue all the way around it. Now, there are certainly lots of women where this is not uh, feasible. The cancer is too large, the breast is too small, but the question then became, do we really need to remove the entire breast? An important development in this process was <laughs> early on, some lumpectomies were done and very quickly radiation therapy, beams of radiation aimed just at the breast was shown to dramatically improve the outcome in women who had a lumpectomy. This is the uh, risk of recurring if they just had a lumpectomy. And if you added radiation in this day and age, an outpatient event, people continue to work on a regular basis they clearly showed a decrease in the likelihood of it coming back in that breast. So the next test here was, well, let's compare total mastectomy, removing the entire breast, a lumpectomy and a lumpectomy and radiation. And lo and behold, when you compared all of these, there was absolutely no difference in survival. And by the way, the data I'm showing is 25 years of follow-up. Um, <clears throat> this study has been followed out now to 30 years. The conclusion here is you didn't need to remove the entire breast. And I must say, this is a question that I answer virtually every day in the clinic. There is no need in terms of overall survival for a mastectomy when the uh, tumor itself can be removed and leave the woman with a good cosmetic result. This study was repeated all throughout the world. Uh, there are now five different studies, on, I'm sorry, six different studies on five different continents that have asked this question. And there's absolutely no difference in survival between a lumpectomy uh, and a mastectomy. And frankly, there's no difference in local recurrence, in other words, recurring in the breast, if you have a lumpectomy and radiation. This is a settled issue. Now, one of the dread complications of breast cancer care for decades, for a, nearly a century, was this swollen arm that you see here. That's called lymphedema. And somewhere between 15 and 50% of women who undergo removal of the lymph nodes under their arm called an axillary dissection suffer from this problem. It can be chronic, it can be quite uh, uh, problematic, and it can be lifelong. Uh, there are treatments, but um, it really is a struggle for many women. So the good thing is that Don Morton and Armando Giuliano came up with a technique called sentinel lymph node biopsy. So what happens is a blue dye, as well as a small amount of radioactivity are injected into the breast and it drains through these tubes called the lymphatics 
to generally the two, three, four lymph nodes that are most at risk. It's generally not one or two. So what we can do now, the theory went, was we take out one, two, three lymph nodes. Turns out that the risk of a swollen arm, not 15 to 50%, but more like 5%. Could this tell us the women who actually needed to have all the lymph nodes removed? So the Italian tumor group asked this very question. What if they just took out the sentinel lymph nodes, those that are most at risk, so if no tumor in the sentinel node biopsy, or they did the sentinel node biopsy plus the axillary dissection and followed those women out? And you can see there was no difference in survival. You didn't have to take out all the rest of the lymph nodes. But there was a big difference in the consequences. Pain at six months, if it was just a sentinel node alone, about 75%. But if you took out all the lymph nodes, it was 91%. But the risk of swelling, sentinel node, uh, only 7%. 75% if you took out the um, entirety of the lymph nodes. So the standard for many years was if the nodes are positive, you go ahead and take out the rest of the lymph nodes. But if they're negative, you just take out those that are most at risk. This, has, uh, this then came into question. So the uh, what's called the Z11 trial was run between 1999 and December of 2004. And it asked uh, the next question. Well, if the lymph nodes were positive, particularly if there's only one or two positive, do I still need to go take out the rest of the lymph nodes and subject this woman to a 15 to 50% risk of a swollen arm? So what this did is uh, randomized women to positive lymph node, you took out the rest of them, or you only took out those two, three, four that were at risk, and then generally followed that treatment with radiation therapy, and in many women, systemic therapy as well. There was absolutely no difference in survival. The bottom line here is we did not have to take out the rest of the lymph nodes in an effort to improve survival. We didn't need to subject these women to a risk of a swollen arm between 15 and 30 percent. We could keep that risk down about five to eight percent. So at the end of the day, you could just take out those that were uh, at risk uh, and did not need to follow that with an axillary node dissection. The next question came up. Well, we started giving chemotherapy and systemic therapies. Maybe the systemic therapy could be given first, and maybe that would shrink these larger tumors and allow us to spare a woman's breast rather than removing it just because the tumor was too large and the breast too small. This study had two focuses. One is to answer the question about surgery. The other was to see whether giving chemotherapy first would make people live longer. So you can see a big study the coin was flicked, then half of the women got chemotherapy prior to the surgery, and half of them got uh, chemotherapy after surgery. And it turns out that there was no difference in survival whatsoever. So whether you got the chemotherapy after surgery or before surgery did not matter. From a surgical point of view, it was quite dramatic. 80% of women had tumor shrinkage. About 40% had their lymph nodes go from cancer in the lymph node to dead cancer, uh, dead cells in the lymph nodes. In other words, they converted cancer. Uh, <clears throat> they killed the cancer entirely in those lymph nodes. But probably most importantly, they could increase the number of women who had lymphectomies. And for women who had larger tumors, greater than two inches, there was a 175% increase in the lumpectomy rate. In other words, sparing many, many women having to undergo a mastectomy. In addition, we found that about 40% no longer had cancer in their lymph nodes, a dramatic change. And even more dramatically, what we found was that if we took this tumor out and there was, uh, took the uh, area uh, that was originally of concern out of the breast and the lymph nodes and the cancer had been completely killed by the chemotherapy, also called a pathologic complete response, those women did beautifully, beautifully, with an extraordinary outcomes. And you can see these are measured at years in terms of overall survival. Well, this led to a paradigm shift. Who gets chemotherapy before surgery? Virtually anybody we know is going to need chemotherapy. They will get it prior to their surgery in an effort to try to make their surgery a whole lot easier and spare them a mastectomy. 
but probably just as importantly, it really became a platform for which we could test new therapies. Can we find new drugs in a much more expeditious way? And Dr. Tan will talk about that in a minute. We have just completed a really very radical trial, if you ask a lot of people, looking at no surgery. So a woman might come to me with what's called a triple negative cancer that's uh, the size of a, uh, uh, an orange, have a tremendous response to chemotherapy. And then we've asked the question, does she need any surgery at all? Can we figure out whether that tumor is now dead? And if so, not operate. And that trial is uh, ongoing. So at this point, I'm gonna turn over the talk to Dr. Tan. She will share her slides at this point. Let me know. Yes. So I wanted to um, start off by saying that treatment of breast cancer is a multidisciplinary, multimodality approach. And Dr. White has reviewed the advances that have been made um, in terms of local treatments, in particular, surgery and that we're moving to do smaller surgery, less surgery. Uh, another component though of local treatment, which we won't have time to discuss, is radiation therapy. But another major component to treat breast cancer is the uh, systemic treatment. And this can mean chemotherapy, endocrine therapy or hormone blockers, uh, different targeted therapy, and also immunotherapy. Okay, next slide. Now, I want to start off with going over um, the goals in treating a localized early stage breast cancer, and that is to eradicate tumor from the breast and lymph nodes and prevent recurrence to distant organs. And Dr. White reviewed how one approach to treat palpable breast cancer is to take the approach of giving neoadjuvant chemotherapy, which means treatment before surgery. And the goal here is to shrink the tumor so that hopefully a smaller surgery can be done, such as lumpectomy, followed by radiation and additional therapy. Interestingly, for the majority of cancers, breast cancers, um, they can be amenable to undergo upfront surgery. Um, and then the treatment that is given after surgery is referred to as adjuvant therapy. Um, and then there also could be a role for that patient to undergo radiation and additional therapy. Okay, next slide. Now, it's important to, to understand there are major targets in breast cancer. Um, this really guides how we treat the different types of breast cancers. The um, targets are listed here and they are the estrogen receptor and progesterone receptor, which are hormone receptors. Breast cancer cells with estrogen receptor and progesterone receptor, which are hormones in the body, need um, estrogen and progesterone to grow. And about 70 to 80% of breast cancers are hormone receptor positive. The other target is called HER2, which stands for human epidermal growth factor receptor 2. HER2 is a protein found on the surface of some breast cells. When a breast cell has an abnormally high level of HER2, it can drive breast cancer growth and spread. And this comprises a smaller number of most breast cancers, about 10 to 20%. Now, when there's an absence of the estrogen receptor, progesterone receptor, and HER2 receptor, on a breast cancer cell. Uh, this is referred to as a triple negative breast cancer because all three receptors are absent. And this also comprises a small amount of the breast cancers that are diagnosed about 50. Okay, next slide. I wanna drill down a little bit more at what happens at the cell level and talk about HER2 breast cancer. And what you can see here is that there is normal expression of this HER2 receptor on cells. And in terms of amount, it's about 20,000 receptors. Um, however, when this HER2 receptor um, or when a breast cancer is found, HER2 overexpression, 
we're talking about a lot more receptors that are present on that cell, um, probably in the order of 2 million receptors. And so that gives rise to um, a HER2 positive breast cancer that then you know, can grow and, and, and divide. Next slide. The good news is that um, with um, the clinical trials, um, with the you know, use of clinical trials and drug development, there has been a, a major breakthrough in how we patients have R2 positive breast cancer, and we have what we call targeted therapy. And as an example, you can see here that there's a drug called trastuzumab. This is an antibody um, that's represented there in the red. Um, and this binds to a particular part of the HER2 receptor that's located on the breast cancer cells in a large amount. And when the drug attaches to that part of the receptor, that then causes a block of signaling, which then leads to uh, a slowdown you know, of the growth of the breast cancer cells. Additionally, there's a drug called pertuzumab, um, which is also another antibody that represented there in the blue. Um, and this also makes contact with the HER2 receptor in a different part compared to the trastuzumab. But the result is similar in that when contact's made, there's a um, less you know, uh, signaling um, that then results in a uh, decrease in cell growth and division. And these tools um, are now used standardly in our clinical practice um, to treat patients that have early stage and advanced HER2 positive breast cancer and have made a um, great impact uh, in helping patients to live longer, uh, you know, with, longer with their breast cancer and also have good quality of life. Move on to the next slide. Another um, class of drugs that I want to highlight because it's very relevant and new um, is called antibody drug conjugates. I know it looks a little complicated, but stay with me on this. Um, you know, I refer to these as smart bombs. Um, one example shown here is called trastuzumab and metanzine, or abbreviated TDM1. But it is important to um, look at this diagram because um, this represents like a newer generation of drugs that are targeting the HER2 receptor. And this is made up of an antibody that I just showed you, the trastuzumab. And uh, there is two other uh, components to it, a linker with a chemotherapy. And you can see that um, it looks like a lollipop with spikes on it, kind of maroon colored. Um, and so these three components, the antibody with the linker, that then connects to the chemotherapy portion of the compound, um, then attaches to the HER2 receptor, and then it gets internalized by the cell. Um, and in this way, it's delivering the chemotherapy in a more directed, specific um, pathway. Um, and then you can see there that the chemotherapy, which is referred to there as the m gets released um, you know, within the cell. So kind of like a, it, it hones in. Um, and that then results in, um, you know, just destruction of the cancer cells. So a very uh, directed approach and one that then also spares patients the typical um, general side effects of, uh, you know, of, of treatment. And next slide. So um, that drug that I just talked about um, changed the standard of care. Um, and so for patients that have HER2 positive early breast cancer, that undergo neoadjuvant chemotherapy and surgery, um, the standard has been to offer those patients, if they have residual disease, um, you know, after receiving those treatments, is trastuzumab. Um, and that, that made a great impact in showing us that um, that treatment, in particular, um, you know, patients can um, live longer without having a recurrence. And so, um, it's natural for us to want to keep making improvements um, in patients' lives. And so this trial, to give you an example of how um, clinical research is important and how we can make an impact and keep moving the field forward, um, this trial called the Catherine trial, which is a phase three trial, um, 
50% of the patients received what at that time was standard of care trastuzumab antibody treatment um, versus the newer drug called TDM1. And so you can see here that the patients that received the TDM1 um, had an improvement um, in the amount of time that they were free of um, having recurrent breast cancer. And so this nicely just shows how um, newer treatments are making an impact in um, you know, our patients' um, lives. Next slide. And then just to um, also um, you know, emphasize the importance of clinical research, um, this is a large international uh, phase three clinical trial that's currently being conducted in the same population, again, HER2 positive patients um, that receive new adjuvant chemotherapy prior to surgery. And if they're found to have residual disease of their breast cancer, this is an opportunity for patients to participate in a, um, a trial where um, they would be treated with our now current standard, which is the, getting the TDM1 um, antibody drug conjugate, or they can receive TDM1 with a newer drug. And this drug is called atezolizumab, which is an immunotherapy drug. And so this trial is available um, here at Living Cancer Institute for patients who fit the criteria. And again, another effort to try to you know, keep improving um, upon our, our, our patients' um, um, lives. Uh, next slide. So just to kind of bring it home locally, um, you know, our research um, vision for the breast program is to have clinical trial opportunities for our patients um, with any stage of disease. And we really wanna, you know, we're aiming to have trials and we do have trials that target specific breast cancer subtypes. For example, HER2 positive breast cancer, which I just showed you an example of. And also trials that have potential to change the standard of care um, or trials that are evaluating newer techniques where we can try to tailor our therapy on an individual level. I do want to highlight, um, because this is unique um, to Living Cancer Institute Asian Health, that we um, have a phase one unit. Um, and these units are located in here in, right in Charlotte and also in Concord. Um, but what the phase one unit can afford patients with is access to novel treatments. Um, these are drugs that are being studied um, first time in humans. Um, they also may be drugs where we're trying to figure out what the appropriate, appropriate amount to give to patients and to give it safely. And so a lot of these drugs um, can um, lead to um, the FDA approving them and, and you know, being available you know, worldwide. Um, so we have the opportunity here um, you know, to be part of that process. Next slide. So I just want to go back um, the paradigm for treating early stage breast cancer, and that is um, or for patients that have smaller tumors, those patients can undergo surgery up front and then get treatment, treatment post-surgery. Um, but there's been um, an important, um, you know, breakthrough uh, with um, trying to individualize our treatment for patients. Um, so next slide. Um, what the next slide is showing is um, molecular profiling assays. And so when I was in training, um, what we used to determine whether patients need chemotherapy or not is looking at the size of the tumor or whether there's lymph, um, cancer present in lymph nodes. But now we're, we're becoming more sophisticated and we are developing uh, tools that can help us identify patients um, who will benefit from you know, the chemotherapy. Um, and on the next slide, um, this shows you a paradigm shift where if a patient is presenting with an early stage breast cancer, does not involve their lymph nodes, but is hormonally driven, does not have the HER2 protein on it, we can send a special test called the Oncotype CX. And then um, basically a piece of the tumor is sent to the lab or an analysis is done on it. And then the um, physician patient will get back a report um, called a recurrent score. And just taking, for example, um, that first scenario where if the recurrent score is 15 or less, which is a low score, this would indicate that a patient with this type of breast cancer uh, would not benefit from chemotherapy. And the only treatment needed for that, for that patient is to get adjuvant um, hormone blockers. And in that way, patient benefits, um, gets, the, gets the appropriate therapy, and is spared the side effects of chemotherapy. Next slide. 
So I just want to, um, in the last few minutes, um, switch and talk about the treatment for metastatic breast cancer, because there have been also important breakthroughs. Um, breast cancer um, can, can spread to lung, liver, and bones. The goals of treating a patient with advanced breast cancer is to extend their life, control cancer symptoms, minimize their side effects from treatment, and optimize their quality of life. And um, just take an example for breast cancers that are hormonally driven, you know, have the estrogen or progesterone receptor, um, we're going to so, treat those um, patients. Just to resume, um, I want to just highlight that there's a new class of drugs called cyclin-dependent kinase 4-6 inhibitors. Um, and this, um, these types of compounds um, work by um, attaching to the CDK4-6 enzymes, which are responsible for cell division. And so this is a novel approach and a new approach and actually has become standard of care to combine these drugs with uh, hormone blockers to treat metastatic patients that have estrogen-driven breast cancer um, and has really showed to improve um, their um, outcome, outcome and, and the, these patients are living longer. Um, I also want to highlight a uh, new paradigm in, in, in also treating our breast cancer patients in that we're in an era of precision medicine. And so we're trying to um, individualize our treatment for these patients and find more precise ways because chemotherapy is, is nonspecific. And so we have tools available where we can um, take a piece of the tumor, send it to a lab, and also get a readout on you know, which proteins may be present in a high amount, a low amount, or which genes may be present or absent. And so this shows you that in this particular case, um, this is an example of a tumor that has um, an alteration in, in the HER2 gene and also another one called PIK3CA. And what's great right now um, is that we have drugs available that can specifically hone in on these targets. Um, and in that way, the treatment is delivered in a more specific manner. So just um, returning um, to um, sort of, you know, what's needed on a global level to successfully treat breast cancer patients and manage them. And so I put that, or we put this on the slide here and, and um, you know, it'd be great to be able to, you know, to have all these bullet points available. Um, and that is, it's important to make an early diagnosis of the, the cancer. And this requir requires prompt evaluation, um, readily available imaging, tissue sampling, pathology services. And as I've stressed before, multidisciplinary care is, is so important. Um, and it also includes patient navigation. Um, here at LCI, we have nurse navigators who have made a tremendous impact um, on helping patients through their cancer journey. Um, another important point is communication among the different disciplines. And as you can see here, um, you know, it's a multi-pronged approach with medical oncology, surgery, uh, reconstructive and plastic surgery, radiation oncology, genetic counseling, and also fertility consultation for women uh, who are childbearing, childbearing age. And it's also um, you know, adequate access to the services listed here, surgery, radiation, and systemic therapy, and also access to a lot of things that I um, highlighted, um, you know, innovation and, and new drugs. So in summary, um, worldwide, breast cancer is the most common cancer in, in women other than non-melanoma skin cancer. In the United States, more than half of these breast cancer, more than half of breast cancers are diagnosed on screening mammogram and the rest as a palpable breast mass. Um, and in the United States, majority of breast cancers are early stage breast cancers and less than 10% are metastatic at the time of diagnosis. Um, as, we've, as we've highlighted, uh, for palpable breast tumors that are triple negative or HER2 positive, a standard approach is to give chemotherapy upfront or what we call neoadjuvant, the neoadjuvant therapy and then proceed to surgery and other additional treatments. Dr. White showed you the data that survival with lumpectomy plus radiation therapy um, is the same as with undergoing a mastectomy. And um, you know, the important development in the field of breast cancer is that we now have tumor profiling that can help predict the likelihood of treatment with chemotherapy in addition to uh, endocrine therapy will be helpful in a patient who has a hormonally driven early stage breast cancer. And I've seen a lot of um, you know, clinical breakthroughs um, in the area of advanced breast cancer. It's a very treatable disease and uh, modern treatments um, really have shown that they can um, improve survival outcome for our patients. 
so that concludes my talk. Um, and this is our team at um, PLCI, and you know, obviously, um, you know, this is this is needed uh, multidisciplinary approach um, to provide the best care and best quality of care for our patients. Thank you. Great. So thanks very much, uh, Antoinette and Richard. So we've got a ton of questions and I'll try to get through as many as I can. Since both of you are regular participants in the ABC and NBC Morning News and other national TV discussions on breast cancer, what I'll do is pretend that I'm uh, any one of the morning moderators and say, please keep the answers tight so we can get through a lot of questions. So the way I'm gonna divide the questions up, there are a bunch that relate to prevention, some early stage disease and some advanced disease. So let's talk a little about prevention and early diagnosis. Several people have asked questions about uh, the population of people who have positive genes, that it, uh, a positive expression of genes that increase their risk. So you didn't spend a lot of time on it, but the BRCA1, BRCA2 genes um, that create increased risk in, in uh, families of having breast cancer, or similarly in families known to have a history of breast cancer. Could you talk a little bit, uh, maybe Richard, um, about the role of prophylactic mastectomy, nipple preservation, what's sort of happening there? Should every woman who's BRCA1 consider prophylactic mastectomy? How do you think through that when advising a patient? Yeah, that's an excellent question. Uh, the topic, in fact, I addressed with a woman just this morning. Uh, about 10% of breast cancer dr are driven by mutations uh, that predispose those individuals to mutations. Now, the fortunate thing is most of those mutations lead to an intermediate risk. So remember that the average Caucasian and actually now average uh, Black woman's risk in the United States is about 12% most of those mutations will put them at a 18 to 25% risk. The BRCA1 and BRCA2, however, put those women at about a 60 to 80% lifetime risk of developing breast cancer in the future. So there is a variety of things we can do in that scenario, some of which are uh, increased monitoring, but we can also surgically remove the breast, which drops that risk not to zero, but by about 90%. Now, there's a number of techniques we're using, uh, including what are called nipple sparing mastectomies, which can have extraordinarily good cosmetic results. If somebody's interested, I'm, I'm more than happy to share photographs, but they uh, are really, really good. Uh, the great thing is we're very lucky. We have six plastic and reconstructive surgeons here who have a particular interest in this, and we've had some extraordinary results. Right. Thank you. And, and just on this theme, uh, either of you could take this. If you happen to be a woman who's BRCA1 positive, is it safe to have a pregnancy? Do you discourage pregnancy? What's the current thinking about the BRCA1 positive patient? And also, because we're seeing more women who get breast cancer at a younger age, what about the woman who's been treated for breast cancer and then wants to go on to have children? What do you guys think about that? Well, I'll take the first part of that question. There's no reason a woman who's uh, uh, of childbearing age should not have a, a, a child uh, based on a BRCA mutation. Okay. The second part of that chemo. Childbearing. After uh, breast cancer, Antoinette, is it yeah. safe to have a kid? Um, yeah. Yeah, um, you know, I think we have, um, there's good data um, and long-term data, uh, you know, showing that patients with, um, you know, breast cancer who undergo, um, you know, chemotherapy, um, that it is, you know, there's no, um, you know, negative sequelae, um, whether, um, you know, they had their breast cancer, you know, adequately treated chemo and then, you know, had the subsequent surgery, or even if they're undergoing chemotherapy, just depends on the timing. Um, you know, if they happen to be diagnosed while they're pregnant and need any chemotherapy. Okay, thank you. And and just for clarification, there, there it was said in the past that young women who'd had breast cancer shouldn't get pregnant. And so I think the point that doctors Tan and White are making is we've come a long way since then in terms of being able to predict natural history, the treatment that's available. And so it's actually one of the things that young women don't have to withhold from themselves. Two very specific questions for either of you. Do either green tea or avoiding folic acid 
give you any protection if you happen to be BRCA1 positive, protection from getting breast cancer. Do you know of any data to support? It's out there in the kind of folk literature. Is it true or is it just one of those things? I think it's one of those things, Derek. I don't, I don't know of any good, you know, um, good evidence, um, you know, for that. Yeah, the, the other thing, this is a great opportunity to point out, we have one of the foremost uh, integrative health programs in the world, thanks to Dr. Ragavan. Uh, <clears throat> we have several individuals who have a particularly focused interest in this. Uh, so the opportunities for lengthy discussions um, uh, are, are out there. Uh, and frankly, we use a lot of integrative therapies along with our standard therapies, uh, a topic for uh, another day, perhaps. Yeah, and just to be very clear, Rich, thanks to me because I brought the people and not because I'm an expert. So please don't call <laughs> me at 10 o'clock at night and ask me about green tea because I'll say I don't know. Uh, still on this theme, uh, a, a couple of really important questions. Uh, one of our viewers asked the question or commented that she has dense breasts and wondered, she had read that if she's having routine mammograms, is it better diagnostically or safer in some fashion to have the mammogram done in the second part of the menstrual cycle? And if you have dense breasts, do you, is it thought that you would be at increased risk of getting breast cancer or is it just that you have dense breasts and it makes the mammographic interpretation a little more complex? Yeah, that's an excellent question. There is no question that having dense breasts puts one at a slightly higher risk of developing breast cancer, but keep in mind, 40% of women have dense breasts. So almost all the information we're sharing with you is a general population. Uh, <clears throat> the timing of mammography, I'm not familiar with any literature that supports a specific timing uh, in a woman with dense breast. There's a lot of investigational work being done on uh, brief uh, MRI, uh, cheaper MRIs, um, there was a paper published uh, just about a year ago that said that um, that might be a direction we need to step into. The problem is with breast MRIs is they're extremely expensive as it exists, uh, somewhere between three and four thousand dollars, and uh, the false positive rate. In other words, they find too much stuff, which causes a tremendous amount of anxiety, uh, which is why we typically would do not use them, except in the setting of high risk patients. That's very helpful, thank you. Um, one other question that we had, and I think this one probably is for you, Rich. You know, in the situation where a woman is at very high risk and elects to have either a complete single mastectomy or prophylactic bilateral mastectomy, what's the thinking about reconstruction? Uh, is it better to have the reconstruction done you know, we're in the unique situation where, as you mentioned, we have a team of six plastic surgeons. We do it down here in town, up at Concord. Um, the teams work together. Is it better to have a delayed reconstruction to do it immediately, or is it actually something that a woman can say, I'd prefer to have it done this way or that? Yeah, that's an excellent question. It depends on the clinical scenario. In the setting of a woman who's having a prophylactic, in other words, preventative operation, we tend to do them at the same time. In a woman who has a relatively large cancer, will need radiation, we tend to do it in a delayed fashion about six months after the radiation is uh, completed. Um, <clears throat> so that is a very individual care driven. Thank you. And just to close out this little piece, um, somebody asked who the top expert in BRCA1 uh, advice is. Uh, it's hard to answer the top expert because I'm sure there are a bunch of people. I can comment that at Levine Cancer Institute, we have Dr. Sarah Elrafai, who is a medical geneticist with a lot of experience uh, in BRCA1 and BRCA2 and all the other predictive mutational genes in cancer. I think I, I can see both Rich and Antoinette nodding. They work very closely together. And then uh, Sarah has a team of six or seven medical geneticists, as, uh, oh, sorry, genetic counselors as well. So if you're looking for advice and know you have BRCA1 or, or have concern about a family history, they're very good people to talk to about risk and avoidance of, of, of risk and so on. I'd like to move now, uh, there are a number of questions coming directly to you, Antoinette, about the checkpoint um, and CDK4-6 inhibitors. 
Um, the questions go along the lines of why are they so interesting? Why so much focus on them? And could you say a little bit about the toxicities that are associated with these new drugs? Yeah. So let's start off with these um, CDK4-6 inhibitors. Um, and so currently um, they are FDA approved um, to treat uh, advanced breast cancer um, that's hormone receptor positive and HER2 negative. And, they're, and in combination with hormone blockers. And the reason why I'm excited about them is because they have shown um, to um, stabilize disease, uh, stabilize the tumors, um, shrink the tumors, and, and in some cases make them you know, go away. And I've seen in my own practice um, that patients are able to be on these um, um, you know, new drugs um, for years. Um, and in terms of side effects, I'd say they're pretty well tolerated. Um, the main thing that I see is that the um, white blood cell count um, can be lowered, um, but thankfully um, I've not seen a lot where in terms of the white count being lowered that patients develop fever and then you know, have to be hospitalized. So um, there can be also some fatigue associated with that. Um, the other set of drugs, um, which also is exciting um, is um, immunotherapy drugs currently the immunotherapy drugs are approved only for a particular subtype of breast cancer, and that's the triple negative breast cancer. The breast cancer does not express all those receptors. Um, currently, that's approved in the metastatic setting, um, you know, as an earlier line of treatment, um, and also for um, high high risk triple negative um, early stage breast cancer patients. It is um, a good question to ask about what those side effects are when we're talking about these immunotherapy drugs, because they are very different from the side effects that can happen with chemotherapy. Um, and the way I try to explain this is it's um, kind of inflammation of different organs. Um, for example, some patients can experience a underactive thyroid or overactive thyroid, and then that can you know, have its own side effects. There can also be um, a side effect of diarrhea, um, but that's as a result that immunotherapy may cause some inflammation of the colon. Um, there also can be inflammation at the you know, side of the lungs, and in that case, patients can manifest as having cough or shortness of breath. So, you know, it is important when when you know when patients are going to receive these therapies that they do receive um, you know counseling about what to watch out for because the side effects are different from chemotherapy. Um, but I'm excited about those compounds because again the trials show that patients are benefiting from these treatments. Antoinette, one of the uh, participants has raised a question that, that I think is fascinating, as I've wondered about as well. Her sense is that there's an awful lot of emphasis in your area of interest, triple negative disease, but what about the person who is estrogen receptor positive and has that repetitive pattern of ER positive, estrogen receptor positive cancer? What about them? Are they chopped liver? You know, what's being done for that population group? Fairly quick answer, please. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, I think, you know, obviously in social media, there's certain emphasis of certain types of breast cancers, but there's certainly the research is focused on treating all the subtypes of breast cancer, hormone receptor positive, as well as HER2 positive. And the clinical research is also driven to treat all of those breast cancers. And as I've shown you in my slide deck, you know, there's been so many important developments, um, you know, that has not been solely focused on triple negative breast cancer, but also those breast cancers. Uh, one question that I'll feel, and I've got a couple more for you. Somebody asked the question about disparities of care, meaning that the underserved populations kind of miss out, and asked what is Levine Cancer Institute doing? Well, you know, let me say first that uh, Navant Presbyterian does some really great work there. And I, I believe that the Michael Jordan sponsored center uh, we'll see up to a couple of thousand, 3,000 patients a year with a range of different problems. Now, I have to say, at the Levine Cancer Institute, we've had a disparities of care program since I started the enterprise. And last year, we saw 68,000 underprivileged people and educated them, did prevention studies and so on. And we've actually published data on the similarity of outcomes in poor people and wealthy people in our studies with lung cancer, lymphoma, and we have data to show the same thing in breast cancer. Some of you will remember D'Angelo Williams, who if I recall was a wide receiver with the Panthers, and D'Angelo set up a fund uh, which was explicitly set up to offset the costs of mammography for underserved populations. And we have mobile units going out all over the city and all over the region 
uh, into rural areas and so on to actually actively screen for breast cancer. And as it happens, Dr. White also oversees a program that looks at colorectal cancer. We have a, a two buses supported by the Leon Levine Foundation that look for lung cancer. Uh, and we also do work in black patients, African-American patients looking for prostate cancer. So it's out there, we're out there doing a lot of work. On the theme of disparity and back to the two of you, somebody asked the question, and it is an interesting one, how come there is such wide variation in follow-up. Some patients being seen at Levine get a whole bunch of different tests. They'll have mammograms, they'll have ultrasound. They may even have MRI scans in follow-up, careful examination. They'll come to our survivorship program. Others will have a two minute checkup in an office with their doctor. What's the right way to approach it? Why the difference in the way different breast cancer programs follow patients? Maybe both yeah, of them. Antoinette and I, actually, when Antoinette first came, she and I addressed this quite pointedly. Uh, we have a very structured follow-up program. The goal is to see individuals about every six months with a mammogram every year. Uh, that would be our standard follow-up pattern. It's uh, intended to be uh, how should we say, user-friendly and mindful of people's time and frankly, time off of work. Now, is there a variety in that? Yeah, there's some variety in that depending on risk. So for example, if a woman has a much higher risk, she may have a different follow-up program. But we have, a, uh, like I said, a very structured follow-up program. Fortunately, we have guidelines that uh, guide that care throughout the LCI system. Great. Right. Um, I think we're pretty close to time. There's one, one question that still stays there. And, and I, I think maybe just a quick summary that I'll give. And one, one person asked, what about the mental health of patients who've been through the mill, who've had treatment? What happens to those folks who get recurrent breast cancer and, and how do they deal with that? And I think how I'd summarize that is the better programs around have active survivorship programs. We have a actually a chair in survivorship held by Dr. Declan Walsh, who again is another internationally renowned authority on, in this case, survivorship. We have counselors, both from the psychological point of view, Rich White mentioned, we have people who look at the issue of integrative medicine in terms of asking questions about what might stop the cancer coming back or what makes you have a healthier lifestyle. Our psychologists will help support people. So I think the answer is as you're looking at being treated for breast cancer, you need to look at comprehensiveness of, uh, of management. Then the final question to either of you, someone has asked who should be tested for BRCA1? Any women with Jewish heritage, family history, who are the people who should be asking for a BRCA1 test and is it covered by insurance? Yeah, the uh, recommendation is anybody with an Ashkenazi Jewish uh, ancestry, particularly if there's a history of breast or ovarian cancer, should be tested. Any woman under the age of 50 should be tested. Any woman who has triple negative breast cancer should be tested. Um, I never discourage anybody from seeing our risk assessment team to try and figure out who should be tested, but those are the broad guidelines. And for Thank the most you. part, they are, you know, there is insurance cards for that. And if not, our genetics uh, program, you know, it's helpful to giving guidance on how to get those covered. And the final question was, you know, how do you do research in this area? And I think the answer is, you listen to programs like this, you can go onto the internet and look at any of the websites run by the American Cancer Society, the American Society of Clinical Oncology. You can look at the breast cancer website that we run. We have a specific program run for young women with breast cancer. Um, most of the comprehensive cancer centers uh, will have information available. Uh, the American College of Surgeons does as well. So at this point, I think I'd like to hand the program back to LJ Stambuk, who uh, hopefully will take control at this point. Thank you so very much, Dr. Tan, Dr. White, Dr. Rago, and this is a great, great and important program. I, I know we have a lot of people participating, but let me just share with you that this goes to our um, uh, 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 <clears throat> library of videos, and, and your last uh, uh, program we did with you on prostate cancer is one of the most viewed programs that we have in the library of the World Affairs Council programs. I'm sure this one will be as well. 
we do send it to all our partners, uh, corporate, individual, and educational. So uh, it will get uh, much, much more uh, play, if you will. Um, and I'm grateful to you as this is such an important topic and such an important uh, uh, educational program to have with you on this global disease. Let me use this opportunity to thanks again to thank again Atrium Health for being a partner with us on this program, International House, Alliance Francaise, and the World Affairs Council of Northwest Ohio. Great to have you here. Thank you all for being here. Thank you to the board members who have participated. And again, thank you, Dr. Tan, Dr. White, and Dr. Raghavan. Appreciate your time. Learned a lot. Thank you. We're adjourned.